Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Jillian Barry, and today we have an absolutely awesome guest with us. We have John Kohler. He has three YouTube channels. You probably know him already, but um, he's from OK Raw, Growing Your Greens, and Discount Juicers. And he is known for being a long-term vegan, long-term raw vegan as well. He's recently gone back to some cooked food. So we're going to have a great discussion today. Make sure you subscribe, hit that like button, and let's get started. Hey, John, how's it going? Good. Just got out of the garden. <laughs> nice. <laughs> like <literally laughs> you are like the garden king. When I think of growing food, I think of you and I just, your videos, I admire you. And it's so great. All the knowledge and everything you teach everyone. I feel like you could have like a university just teaching everyone how to grow food. Yeah. Growing food, eating healthy and processing fruits and vegetables. Cause that's like my life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm just wondering, like someone like me, I'm living in an apartment currently and like I've never grown any food. I'm a raw vegan for somebody who lives like in a space where they can't grow food outside. Are there options to grow anything inside or no? Absolutely. So the most important two things that grow indoors are number one, sprouts. So hopefully you're already growing sprouts. I actually haven't grown sprouts before. I buy sprouts and I absolutely love sprouts, but I want to get into growing my own sprouts. Yeah, super simple, super easy. So that's the first step. Then the second step is microgreens. So if you have like a, yeah. just, if you could fit like a rack, it's like, I don't know, six feet, six feet tall, four feet wide. You could grow like microgreens on there. So you could harvest one tray, which is like 10 by 20 inches a day wow. and just have it on a rotating basis to be able to eat that. And actually on some level, you'll probably be eating healthier than me at that point. Cause I don't grow microgreens cause it's just too much. Like they're like, they're it's like a lot babies. of work. Yeah. They're like babies. Whereas the vegetables I grow in my garden are like raising teenagers. They yeah. can do what they want and they're pretty much self-sufficient and I can't micromanage everything because I'm already managing a lot. <laughs> yeah, you are. You're a very successful businessman. I admire you. You're awesome. And okay. okay. Just one more thing about growing before we get into everything else. If somebody wants to grow something in their garden and they, they've never grown anything outside, like what is something super simple and nutrient dense that they could start with? I mean, the easiest things to grow are weeds and weeds mm -hmm. are super nutrient dense because they're the genetics aren't really messed with too much. So, you know, go, go to a lawn, find a lawn, go to a park and find like dandelions growing in like the little, you know, dandelion ball puff balls you would blow on as a kid. Yeah. Find those, bring those home and plant those in your garden and you'll have dandelions that you like, like it's hard to mess up dandelions because they don't need nothing. <laughs> yeah They'll grow in a crack in the sidewalk you know and that's like yep. super nutrient dense and there's a lot of other weeds that are edible weeds i made a video with uh katrina blair um you know she was another raw foodist on my gardening channel where she wrote a book on the top weeds you could find in urban areas and um i made a deal with her like if they buy the book from her she'll send the seeds for those exact weeds so that wow. people could grow them in the garden so that you could learn about like the different stages of growth. And then also you could grow them and they're the easiest things to grow. So, I mean, I could recommend different vegetables that are easy, but I mean, you ask for nutrient dense and super easy and that's yeah. it really. And I've heard that when you grow your food and you eat it like freshly picked from your garden like that, I've heard there's just so much more life force. I forget the percentage versus if you're eating something, obviously that's been trucked around the world to the grocery store, right? Oh, I mean, that's the one reason I grow stuff. I mean, I add a lot of nutrients to the soil. Actually, I was making a soil mix, top it off my bed. I'm going to plant it tomorrow. And, you know, but even if you don't have the best soil, even if you just grow stuff and then just pick things fresh, you know, the, the life force is like huge. I, 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 it's hard for me to eat like a lot of greens and things from the store after like growing and picking my own, especially because like the kale in this juice, although there's, you know, store-bought greens, because I don't grow all my greens, but I grow all the important ones. Um, you know, my kale tastes so much better in the store and the life force is just so much more vibrant. I mean, I, it like, I need less. I need like half as many greens out of my garden than I would at the store. Wow. Incredible. That's incredible. And it must be so much better for your gut microbiome too, when it's fresh like that. Oh yeah, because I mean, in an industrial agriculture system, they're harvesting it, they're washing it, they're doing who knows what to it, and then you get it, and then they're spraying it at the store. So there's like all these steps where they're, you know, lowering or well, they're selecting for microbes. You know, they're not. Yeah. They're gonna 
they want to select out and get rid of the bad ones, keep the good ones, hopefully, but then they might disappear too. And the other thing is like the, I mean, it's post harvest is how they are affected in one level, but then the other level is how are they grown? I mean, are they just grown in cow manure? You could use organic cow manure, grow plants, and then you, you could get E. coli and get bad bacteria and get sick from it. Yeah. You know, I go out of my way to actually spray out beneficial bacteria on my plants knowingly because it helps the plants grow. And then when I eat the plants, now I'm getting like nature's probiotics that are living on the plants. And I, yeah. I, I, I like spray out a whole bunch of different kinds because I'm just going to let nature figure out which ones need to be on which plant. Cause I, I mean, I don't know all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And do you eat a hundred percent organic? I eat a high percentage organic depending on the season and what time of year and what I'm getting. It's between 90 to 95%. Yeah. And what foods, like, I know a lot of people, like they say they can't afford to eat all organic or they don't eat all organic. Are there some foods that you would recommend like totally steering clear of that are conventional? I mean, to me, like greens, like I don't, I, I, it's rare. I mean, if there's not organic greens, like if I'm traveling, like I won't eat greens. That being said, I also ha always have greens in my garden e every time of year, 365 days a year. Some days, some days I have more and some days I have less. This time of year, I have, I'm having a lot actually. Um, but I'd say greens because like bug damage on greens, I mean, a bug gets on the green, they eat it, there's holes and then they can't sell it. So they got to like spray them to make them look nice. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, a lot of greens. I mean, the dirty dozen is a list that people could look up, which is, you know, research stuff. Mm -hmm. I might say the other thing I'd probably say is like berries, you mm -hmm. know, and other fruits that you eat the skin and all, you know, I would say grapes, like raisins, non-organic raisins are really, like really bad in pesticide because the pesticides are concentrated when it's dehydrated, but even just non-organic grapes, I'm not a big fan of, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I won't, basically I won't eat them. <laughs> so I, I just won't eat them. So like in a, in the winter time, like right now, like I go out of my way to find good fruits because like, there's a lot of non-organic fruits available. Like you get non-organic watermelon and non-organic cantaloupe, but mm -hmm. those are not even available organic. So then I'm not eating those. So then I got to like find other, other fruits to eat. Yeah. You know, my selection is a little bit limited by the, my choices. Yeah, exactly. Well, so you recently went back to some cooked food, which I'm super interested to talk about in a little bit, but first I would love to hear like what first led you to raw veganism? Cause I don't know your story. Like if you were sick or what led you there. And I know some of my viewers, they were saying they want to hear that as well. So if you'd oh, like yeah. to share, I would love to hear that. Sure. Yeah. So basically what happened to me was I had spido meningitis right when I was out of college, you know, it was about a year out or, or something like that. And then I got spido meningitis and I remember having a really bad headache. And then I remember vomiting. And then my parents actually had to pick me up because they live in an hour away and then take me to the hospital because I was just and then I, I, I remember just like passing out I get to the hospital and I passed out and then I just wake up in like the hospital bed all laid out with the IVs in me and everything and I'm like doctor like what's going on when am I going to get out of here that was my first question like when am I going to get out of here what do I got and when am I going to get out of here and they're like you have spinal meningitis and he's like you might not make it out of here <laughs> and I'm like I'm just thinking to myself, like, wow, this really sucks, man. This is not supposed to happen. So you're like 60 or 70. Cause I, you know, I was like, you know, just out of college graduated with my degree in wow. business. So I'm like, this is not good. So then I'm like, he's like, we have no treatment for you. He's like, you might make it, you might not make it. And I'm like, then I'm, that was like, yeah, because wow. it had like a viral version, you know, so they can't really treat like a lot of viruses. They can treat bacteria with like antibiotics, but like, and the other thing is that it was spinal meningitis, which basically affects your brain and there's no like immune system in your brain. Wow. So it was like, like the doctors could not do anything. Even if I had a million dollars, which I didn't have nowhere near a million dollars, then I could Mr. Doctor, $1 million don't cash unless John walks out alive. Like all the money in the world couldn't save me then I really thought about like what was really important. If all the money in the world can save me, but then I'm like supposed to get a job and make all this money. And that's like supposed to be successful is making all this money. Mm -hmm. But then it can't even save you if you're in the hospital with some crazy disease, whether it's the disease currently going around or something else. Like what the heck good is money anyway? So I, I was glad I really had that lesson 
at a young age, you know, to know that like, let's not worship money. I mean, money is a great tool because yeah, it's definitely important to have in our society, the way that society is set up, but it's not everything. And I think too many people are just focused their lives around making money and working and doing things and all this stuff. And yeah, you know, when I almost lost my life, I really appreciated like all I wanted when I was like lying in the hospital bed was like, I just want my health back and I don't care about my, I could be broke because of, because I want to live. I want to get out of here. Right. I prayed so I could only say through higher powers, I was able to make it out of there because the doctors had no, you know, treatment for me. And so I asked the doctors, like, why did I get this in the first place? And what they told, what he told me was, he says, you have complement immune deficiency. So you have a weaker immune system than most people. So you're more susceptible to getting sick than most people out there. That's what he told me at the time. So that's all I knew. And I'm like, he's like, but we have an immunization for you. So maybe you won't get, you know, spinal meningitis next time, but it only immunizes you against these certain strains or something like that. So then I'm like, no, I don't want your shot because like, you know, they couldn't guarantee I was going to get better when I was sick. And I'm like, why am I going to do this now that it only immunizes me for certain things and not other things? And I'm like, that, I, that, doesn't, that doesn't seem like a good solution for me. So then I got out of there and all I knew is the doctor told me I had a weak immune system. And all I knew is that I need to somehow build up my immune system so that I wouldn't get sick again. And this is before like epigenetics came out and how we could influence our genes, turn ones on, turn ones off and all these things by our environment. So anyways, long story short, I was watching TV and I saw a Juice Man infomercial known as Jay Cordich. And he's like promoting like juicing in an infomercial that sold lots of juicers back in the day. And the one thing that I, I really remember hearing from that infomercial was juicing Build your immune system. And I didn't know nothing about health. Just out of college for business. I mean, I thought I ate pretty healthy. Didn't eat red meat and stopped drinking alcohol, actually, by that time. But I still ate nowhere near enough fruits and vegetables and nowhere near healthy. Although I read my ingredient labels and thought I ate healthy, like most yeah. people out there. And so anyways, I heard Jay Cordage say, juicing builds your immune system. And I'm like, all right, I gotta, guess I got to start juicing. So then I got on the phone, ordered the juicer. And I don't want to say the rest is history because the juice, they, back in the day, they didn't have Amazon Prime. They're like, yeah, the juicer will be there in like three weeks. And I'm like, three weeks? I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, I went to Walmart and luckily at Walmart, they had one on clearance for like 20 bucks. So then I bought it, brought it home. I'm trying to juice stuff like the juice man on the infomercial. The thing stopping, just getting clogged up and like smoking. And I like drink <laughs> it because it's just like a piece of junk. I mean, maybe that's why I sell juicers and demonstrate them to this day, but because um, there's just so much garbage out there. But so, so anyways, I started juicing and then I did that for about six months. Then I was at a health food store buying organic produce because I learned about that. And then I saw a book called Cleanse and Purify Thyself by Dr. Richard Anderson, which then talked about colon cleansing and, you know, getting your colon clean and all this kind of stuff. And that you know, you shouldn't go back just to eating the junk food and, you know, crap food you ate to toxify your colon. He talked about eating raw foods after you get off, you know, this cleanse thing. Jay Cordich, interestingly enough, also talked about, you know, the one thing that prematurely ages you faster than anything else is cooked foods. Don't put cooked foods in your body. So to have Jay telling me, this guy that said, do this cleanse, telling me, then I did the cleanse. And then, I, then my skin cleared up for the first time in my life because I had, I was, you know, as a child, I had asthma, allergies, eczema. And my eczema totally cleared up for the first time in my life after going on this cleanse program. And I was like, wow, the doctors can even do this with all their hydrocortisone creams and all this crap. And I'm like, this is what I need to do because I'm building my immune system. I detoxed all that crap and now I'm not going to go back. This is the way I need to live if I, I want to live and be alive. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's, that's, a short, that's a short story. And then I've basically been learning and researching as I as I go and like learn how to grow food because I understood, you know, after about 10 years, how important the quality of the food that we eat mm -hmm. is, especially, you know, raw foods stem from live foods, which, you know, we've, a lot of people have forgotten these days and live foods have the life force. That's why sprouts, they're full of life force, you know, sprouts are probably more full of more life force than my vegetable garden out back. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and want to have things as, as live and as radiant with as much life force as possible. You know, so anyways, my journey has just led me to where I am today. And, you know, I even get into the hardcore and like how to preserve the most nutrients when we process our food through different vacuum blenders, slow juicers, and then, you know, now heat processing my food. I don't really prefer the term cooked too much myself mm -hmm. because cooked food just cooked food is so vast on what it means. And people think, oh, I'm eating cooked. I'm eating McDonald's or I'm eating a stupid vegan restaurant that I wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole still, you know, so it, I'm eating very select items for certain specific reasons, you know, because that's once again, part of my journey and my, you know, my, my, what I'm doing, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, exactly. Um, when did you start eating cooked or as you call it, heat processed food? When did you start introducing that to your body again? And what was the first thing you ate? Like, what did you first start eating and why? <laughs> So I, I never claimed to be 100% raw foodist, maybe back in the early years, but I've claimed to be 99% raw. Yeah. You know, so like the 1%, I have a video on it, things I eat that are not raw, nuts and seeds, you know, some frozen, um, you know, organic vegetables have been blanched and heat processed because technically they're not raw. Dried fruits, maybe heated too hot, you know, just random things like that. And then I started, I think probably the first thing I incorporated was some like artichoke hearts, actually. Mm -hmm. So I'd always loved artichokes as a child because we'd have like family gatherings and just eat artichokes. And I'd always love the flavor of artichoke hearts. So like probably some canned, art, not canned, they were in a glass bottle because I won't get canned. Glass bottle artichoke hearts were probably one of the first things I ate. And why did I do that? Well, because it, it reminded me of good times when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. But also I've learned about some of the research on artichokes and how health beneficial they are. I mean, not only are they, even if they're, even if they're heat processed, they're super high in antioxidants. In addition, they have, you know, beneficial fiber, you know, um, that are good for our microbiome, gut microbiome. In addition, uh, it's a flower. So it's kind of cool. You're eating more flowers. And also it's a thistle family plant that detoxifies your liver and especially mm -hmm. with all the toxins in the world. I think more people need uh, liver detoxification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. With the gut microbiome, I'm curious. I just ordered this kit from a company and like, um, right. uh, no, it's Viome. I think it was, it is. Oh, bi 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 so B have you heard of these? Like, what do you think of these companies that say they can test your gut microbiome and analyze it? Yeah. So I think every, I haven't looked into it super hardcore, but every company is a bit different in what they do and they're testing. But I think if it's a good major brand, it's probably good. I just ordered an ombre test. So that's a gut microbiome test. It's like a lot less than the biome. You got the biome, right? With a V? The V, yeah, the biome. Yeah, so that was like, was it 150 or something? Yeah. Yeah, so the one I got was like normally 100. And then if you use a coupon code, welcome30, you could get like 30% off. So then it dropped it to like 69 bucks. Wow. So I got, I got and, then if, and then if you only have one in your shopping cart, It'll say, do you want a second one for 50 bucks? So then I said, yes. <laughs> and then now I got my overall cost down to 60. So I'm, I'm probably going to test my dog actually and see how his microbiome is like in a human test. I already got his dog microbiome tested for dog microbiome, but I didn't particularly care for the results too much because he eats a little bit different kind of diet for him. <laughs> but yeah. maybe I hope my dog's microbiome is better than a fifth grader. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. You know what? I think so many people don't realize just like the importance of the gut microbiome. I really realized that because after a couple of years of eating raw, I completely reversed like a super serious, like celiac autoimmune problem that I thought I would always have. Right. And then I realized like it was a gut problem and the glyphosate. And so I truly believe in like living plant foods and like eating the biggest variety, whether it's raw or cooked. And just introducing so many different variety of plant foods for the strongest gut microbiome and therefore the strongest immune system, right? Yeah. So I think it'll be interesting when I do my test, my microbiome test, I have a few friends that are also raw and maybe, uh, you know, we could make a video sharing our different microbiome tests and hopefully <laughs> <laughs> mine is, mine is, you know, has a better diversity or whatever they want to call it because, I, you know, I try to really go out of my way to like eat a wide variety, grow a garden or what I'm teaching don't work. <laughs> yeah. But, but I would hopefully based on the science think that, you know, what I'm doing is hopefully pretty good. And, you know, but also too, it's not only what you eat, but also your, 
you know, as when you're a child, a lot of our microbiome, according to what I've, what I've learned is, is formed when we're a child and I was mm-hmm. not breastfed, which me too, you know, mm-hmm. is not optimal for your microbiome. So I'm kind of like, need to like <laughs> work harder than that maybe average person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so you're, you're back on cooked food now. Heat I'm just wondering, or heat processed. Some, um, so I mean, I've only, today I've only eaten raw stuff. I've, yeah. I haven't eaten any, anything heat processed. Usually at the end of the day, after my raw meal, I'll have a few heat process items yeah. just yeah. To, for microbiome enhancement, uh, mainly and uh, nu- nutrients mainly. Yeah. And do you find that it's pretty easy to stay on track with like the healthier heat processed foods? Because I know for a lot of people, it can be a slippery slope if they're raw and then they start introducing some heat processed foods. It's super easy for them to just be like, let me have this coffee. Let me order a pizza. Let, like, it, you know, do you find you have more cravings now that you've had some introduced heat processed food or no? Well, that's good. I don't at all, because here's the thing. Most people that go back to eating some heat processed foods have been doing raw for two or three or four years. And you yeah. stay raw for 26, 25 years. I don't know. I've been, I was doing it for 25, 26 years. So hardcore in my in my, in my approach and sticking with it solid, like I've lost like all those stupid cravings because I don't like whatever. And the other thing, so that's number one, do raw foods for 25 years and then introduce a small amounts of certain select heat processed foods. Mm -hmm. Number one, you probably won't have any cravings. Number two, more importantly is don't flavor and try to make the cooked foods taste better than they actually are. Yeah. So like, you know, I'll keep some beans. I'll eat plain beans. You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. I I, I eat organic cherries today. I'd rather eat organic cherries. They taste a hell of a lot better than just, you know, cooked beans, you know, or like I eat potatoes when I eat potatoes. I don't buy the stupid russet potatoes. Those are like going to raise your glycemic levels and like not healthy for you in my opinion what about sweet do you eat sweet potato or purple potato or no i I do so that's the thing i eat purple small potatoes and like select kinds so like those purple potatoes that are like light purple on the inside those are lame i get the ones that are deep (laughs) rich purple on the inside and they're like they're not sweet like these are not bread for sure content because i'm not eating cooked foods for sure content Mm-hmm. I'll eat fruits, man, or I'll have a fruit juice for sugar content, man. I'm eating the potatoes for their special different kinds of, you know, fibers and more mm-hmm. importantly, the purple anthocyanin so I can ramp up my purples. And for sweet potatoes, like it's rare. I'll eat them on a rare occasion, like the yellow, the orange sweet potatoes, because they're pretty sweet. I had one. I'm like, well, these are kind of sweet. If I eat too many of these, I might want to just eat more so I'm like, they're well, delicious I'd eat, yeah i'd rather eat fruit but then i buy the purple sweet potatoes and actually right now i just dug up purple sweet potatoes that i grew from my garden and i'm eating those and actually they taste better than the store yeah actually and they're not sweet either you know and i once again those have been solely researched for their microbiome benefits um you know if they're heated and then cooled and then eaten you know, the starch gets more complex. That being said, you could also eat purple sweet potatoes raw. So before I started heat processing them for the longest time, I would just juice them and get them into me that way. But people don't, people need to realize that whether you eat it raw or heat processed or heat processed and then cooled, you're going to get different. It's going to favor different gut buddies, different Mm -hmm. micros, because the starches are in different little bit formats. And when it gets more complex from heating and then cooling, versus just raw where it's more raw starch versus you know just heated you know so like i i don't want to discriminate against different kinds of like Mm -hmm. you know fiber that Mm -hmm. may be getting more complex or whatever different types as the produce is processed a little bit differently and i think it's the way you cook the food too like the way you heat the food right because i when i first turned raw five years ago i was studying the gerson institute a lot and they do some raw and heated foods And they like in their book, I remember reading somewhere, like they would stress the importance of how you heat the food, like, and how it's makes such a difference on the food and the reaction in your body, the way you cook the food. Oh, absolutely. I would say that, you know, like the worst way to introduce cooked foods into raw foods that is frying food, like, you know, um, putting it in oil and fried it because then if I probably have some fried fries, even without salt, it probably tastes hella good. Because there's so many toxic reactions, it's creating carcinogens, <laughs> and it'll probably taste good. I probably won't deny that, but I don't do that because it's so damn unhealthy. Yeah, and you just <laughs> feel like an inflammation overload straight through your body, right? 
or yeah, or putting stuff on like a barbecue and getting it black or putting it at a high temperature. Or I would even say a lot of vegans might not like this, but using an air fryer, right, to get to get the moisture out at a high temperature creates carcinogens, toxic, creates these different reactions. That's why it smells so good. You eat it, then it tastes good too. So like, that's a way I, that's another thing I do. I don't heat process my food using those toxic cooking methods. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm still a raw food to the core, you know, so, but I, so all I do is I do an instant pot that the temperature doesn't get above like in Fahrenheit, you know, about 212 degrees. And, you know, by keeping the temperature the lowest as possible, I'm not creating all these damn toxins. And also, you know, I'm, I'm breaking down some of the fibers to make them better for my gut buddies and also making, removing some of the toxins potentially in certain foods so that I could eat them, you know, mm -hmm. and, and have access to them so that I can have a greater diversity of plant foods. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, when was the last time you had an animal product? And do you supplement B12, right? I'm pretty sure you do. Yeah, I do supplement B12 and I haven't eaten any meat knowingly unless somebody slipped to me somewhere. <laughs> um, shit. And like I was raw for like a two or three years and I went on a boat with my buddies and my buddy caught a fish and he basically lightly cooked it on the fire like, I don't know, over 20 years ago, maybe 23 years ago. I don't remember. And then I had a fish. So that was like the last time I knowingly ate meat. Wow. Yeah, that meat. And then on dairy. I'd have to say, I don't know, maybe it's been like 10 years. Cause I, I mean, all, all I've experimented with raw dairy through different parts. Cause I've always heard different things. And the last time I experimented, it must've been maybe 10 years ago. I don't exactly remember the date. Cause I don't really keep up to date, but like it, it dairy just does not do well for me. So like me from too. another creature. So like, but what I do want to try one day is I want to try human milk. People will think, Oh, that's gross. Dude, we're, that's a that's a biological food for us. Maybe when not when we're adults, yeah. But when we're babies, that's the best food for us. And I yeah. got neglected. I never got <laughs> okay, well, milk for my mom. So I'm still breastfeeding, so I can pump some for you, John. You can try some of my right illegal to ship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like I think that'd be really. I mean, and also too. I mean, there are there there are documentaries on the benefits of breast milk and you know, cancer, you know, yeah. benefit for even adults, you know, because I mean, it's so potent in the right kind of nutrients for us and microbiome benefits, especially from a, I mean, I would drink your breast milk. I mean, I'm not <laughs> saying that in some kind of sexual way because you eat healthy and it's like, yeah, somebody else offered me their breast milk and I don't know what the hell they're eating, man. It's like, I don't <laughs> want to get some nasty breast milk. True. <laughs> No, you know what? It's actually a thing in the like uh, workout community. Somebody asked me, one of my friends said, I have a friend who works out pretty heavy. He wants to know, can he buy some of your breast milk off you? Like, this is a big thing in the, in like, in the gyms, like guys want to drink it to bulk. They say it makes you bulk up even more. Yeah. Cause that's know. protein. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what do you think about protein? Like plant-based protein. I love, I have a lot of plant-based protein. I love it. I think we need protein. I like it, but what are your, what are your views on protein? Like a protein supplement or even just like plant-based proteins. Do you think it's important for people to like include these plant-based sources, you know, like spirulina, spinach, lentils, whether they're soaked or cooked, like broccoli or protein powders or all that. Sure. So, I mean, this is my protein right here. Green juice. This has like, I don't know, I made like five jars. I had like six heads of romaine, three bunches of kale for my garden, celery and some cucumber in there. And I mean, we should get our protein from plants. The most important thing is eating a wide variety in different kinds of plants. I mean, I also eat nuts and seeds and a big variety of nuts and seeds for protein. But then I also take algae powders, you know, as well and fresh algae. I get fresh spirulina at the farmer's market sometimes in California. And then that stuff's like super good. But I mean, the thing is this, like I also eat some beans, but I don't necessarily eat the beans for the protein content. You know, mm -hmm. there's ways to get enough protein on a raw foods diet. Cause I've done that for over 25 years. And mm -hmm. I don't think we need to eat cooked foods to get protein. And your proof and how, since you've been health conscious like this, have you ever gotten sick? Oh yeah. I'm oh, you have. I, I'm not going to say I never got sick, you know, yeah. but I'll say I rarely get sick. Yeah. Yeah. And some okay. raw foodists I know don't get sick, but you know, I, I'll say I rarely ever get sick. It's, I mean, if I stayed home, 
especially during quarantine and all this crap. Like I just won't get sick. It's just, I just don't get sick. When I get sick is this, um, is when I travel and then I'm not taking care of my body because I'm not on my program and I'm in an airplane and, and like have to deal with a lot of other people. That's when something's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But if I'm just in my little bubble box, just doing my normal business, going out to places, shopping and hiking or whatever else I'm doing, I, I won't get sick. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. So I'm curious back on the heat processed food. Um, how is your digestion still just as good? I know me, like I've tried over the years incorporating some cooked food, heat processed food. And it always like, unless it's like some quinoa in a salad or something like that, but other things always throw off my digestion and it slows it down. And like, I don't feel as high vibe and like as good. So do you still feel like as amazing as high energy, you wake up in the morning, you still feel as good. Your digestion is as good. I mean, I think my digestion is better personally. Wow. Like, you know, like, cause the thing is like, when I would eat high fruit, my, I felt my digestion wasn't super optimal. And that's just me personally. Maybe everybody's a little bit mm -hmm. different and mm -hmm. all this stuff. But, but now that I'm eating some heat processed stuff and, you know, more importantly, a, a wider range of different kinds of fibers, especially like the sweet potatoes or potatoes. Last night, actually, I ate lotus root for the first time. Wow. And artichoke heart and artichokes, like fresh artichokes, you know, that I cooked in the instant pot for 30 minutes. Um, like, I, I really have, I have, it, it, the, so digestion wise, like it is really good. I don't, my transit time is really good. I've got nice, big, long, fat ones. I don't want to say too much information, but like, it's just really, they're really nice shits, man. If I'm saying, you know, so, yeah. um, <laughs> but otherwise, I mean, energy wise, I, I feel the same. And that, I think that's the thing, you know, it's like, we don't want to over, well, I'm going to say I don't overdo heat process. And once again, you, it's a, like you said, it's a slippery slope. And I get that because when I first got into raw foods, you know, I thought I'd just have some baked potatoes and I'd have one and then I want two and then I want three. And then every night instead of eating a salad, I'm eating baked potatoes. And that mm -hmm. happened to me when I was younger, but I was baking them. <laughs> and I was <laughs> at a different point in my journey because I was just brand new into it. And I had broken up with a girlfriend at the time. So I was like emotional eating. But nowadays, it's not like I, I eat a three or four perfect potatoes. I'm like, like, I don't know. <laughs> Let's eat some fruit now. <laughs> and I know some, I know some people, I know a friend of mine, she had like, she says she's having major problems with bloating and stuff like that and digestion. And she's eating a lot of raw and a lot of cook and cooked. And I feel like if you're just eating raw and cooked all through the day, like for a lot of people that would throw off their digestion, maybe it's better to eat like all raw and then like a cooked or a heat processed dinner. Like, do you do that? Or do you sort of just mix it all in through the day and it's fine? No, like no, I have a specific, I have a method to my madness. So <laughs> I do all raw all day. I could just be a raw food. Some days if I don't have any heat processed stuff or I don't feel like making it, I don't eat any heat processed stuff. I don't need it. If I'm traveling, I don't eat heat processed stuff because I don't have it. And I'm, I can't cook it myself because I'm not eating the heat processed stuff from some place because they're not heat, they're not processing it to my specifications. Right. <laughs> so. Um, so, yeah, I just eat all raw and then I have a little bit of heat processed stuff. And here's a trick like it, actually you could get bloated on a raw or cooked diet, depending if you're especially if you're making dietary changes that are like drastic that your microbiome's not not used to. But so for me, I just eat all raw. Then it like some ways, I'll, some of the ways I'll incorporate heat processed foods is I'll make a big salad or these days I usually make a big soup. And then maybe I have some extra beans that I don't want to eat plain. So I just put the cooked beans in my soup. Yesterday I cooked like, like three different kinds of mushrooms. And so when I have a jar of the mushrooms that then I'll like drain the water out of because it's like a little bit of water in there. Then I'll cut them all up and then put them in a salad. So when I eat heat processed foods, it's like along with my raw food meal, mm -hmm. you know, and I've read that it's so much easier for your body to digest when you eat it along with the, with the raw foods versus if you're just eating it alone without all those enzymes and the raw foods there. Right. And then the other thing is I'll eat a raw food meal. And then afterwards I might have, you know, two artichoke hearts or like four little, four or five little purple potatoes, or I might have like one or two purple sweet potatoes. And then that's it. Like, that's the extent of my heat process. Because I mean, I'm not, I'm not like gorging and binging on heat process crap, 
I mean, and that would be at the first. that would be at the end of the day, then, right? That you eat yes, it at the yeah. Absolutely. See, that's smart. That's what I feel like a lot of people have issues with, and why what causes a lot of digestive issues with people, and they don't realize. Like a lot of people don't under like don't get it, and they would eat like fruit after eating like a potato and stuff like yeah, that. You know? Yeah. And then the other thing is, I do take digestive enzymes every day at the end, actually after I eat the heat process meal. You know. Mm hmm. So that's, I think those are all important things. And maybe that's why that's working for me. Plus, you know, my microbiome, like I've always tried to eat a lot of different kinds of raw foods, There's many things that can be eaten raw and some things that they say you're not supposed to eat raw. I still eat raw, mm -hmm. Just, you know, much smaller quantities of some, you know, toxic, potentially toxic leaves and things that I grow. Um, and I'm always experimenting with different kinds of like, I go to trade shows for the health food industry. I'll try these different powders and all different kinds of crazy foods. So I'm like always trying to challenge my microbiome, you know, and my gut to, you know, get it more resilient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so to mm -hmm. me, just eating some heat processed food is just making my gut more resilient and being able to deal with different kinds of things. Yeah. And doing it slowly, you know, and, and I don't expect to like increase my heat processed food consumption, like at all. Like I, I like where I'm at. I'm doing raw. I'm doing a little bit of heat process to you know, get a little bit more variety, get a little bit different fibers and some more, you know, micronutrients that are not in foods that I'm currently eating. And do you feel like now that you've introduced that back into your diet, do you feel like socially it has changed things at all? Because I know some people when you only eat raw, like you feel you can sometimes like nobody eats that way, usually when you're around a lot of people, right? So was that hard for you eating all raw, like in a social setting versus now introducing some heat processed food? I'm a hermit anyway, so it don't matter. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, so like, and here's the thing, like, even if I went out, I still wouldn't go out to eat because it's still all toxic at restaurants and like, they're not going to heat process the food the way I want it. So I'm not going to eat it anyway. So it's like that. That's just a moot point for me because the way I, because like, I'm really into the processing, like, like with juices or with even like blenders or heat processing or even drying food. The process is critical. Most people aren't going to give a crap, but I do because I, I believe it makes a difference. And if even these small differences over time could be a huge difference in the long run. You know, by using a high speed juicer, science shows you're lowering some of the, the nutrients in there. And by using a slow juicer, it's better. But, in, you know, some of the science also shows using a vacuum blender is even superior. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because I just use a standard, like a high, a pretty high end good, like standard blender that's not a vacuum blender. And I've been thinking like about getting a vacuum blender because it's so much better, right? For your body and for with the way it processes the food. Yeah. So that's the first thing is to, if you use a vacuum blender, like, you know, Lisa from Raw Food Romance told me that like the main thing she's noticed is like she gets less bloating because think about it when you're blending up stuff you know, you get this much, you start with this much and you have this much when you're done, it's all the air in there and you're drinking that. So now you get more bloating. So I was like, she's like, I never heard her head. I never realized that myself, <laughs> myself, but she's like, yeah, we, we get a lot less bloating and gas and belching and this stuff. Cause we're not drinking air. Yeah. It's actually you know? crazy. Yeah. yeah it's... And then for, for me, I'm all about the nutrients, you know? So from actually, I just got a, for the first time, most people love how it tastes. Cause it, your, your smoothies and things will taste stronger. And also more importantly, especially for me, because I do meal prep, they last longer under storage because you're not oxidizing all the antioxidants. That's mm -hmm. going to protect the food later on to keep it, it fresh if you're storing it or more antioxidants for you when you're eating it. Plus it's better flavors. Um, but what was I saying? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, and so the flavor is better and it's stronger. And actually I just had the first vacuum blender returned she's the lady returned it she says i don't like how strong the flavors taste i really like the muted flavors of the standard blender <laughs> wow <laughs> like man to each their own like people don't I... care like they just want something that tastes good and that's what they're used to and yeah that's the thing you know it's like people get used to certain things and that's what they like and then they don't like their new slow juicer that makes a higher quality juice but it tastes a little bit different or it works yeah different. You know. And for a juicer, what do you think is the best quality juicer for the most reasonable price? And then the best juicer for like the most you can spend. <laughs> um, so I always recommend a slow juicer 
And then after mm -hmm. that, I would say it depends because it's like every different produce texture from a leaf to a root to a fruit to a stem, they're all different textures. And you can't just blanket say this juicer is the best because, you know, this influencer says this yeah. one's the best of yeah. everything for everything. <laughs> and I sell juicers. I test them all. I, I juice so many different things more than it, probably anybody on the planet. <laughs> At least I have videos more than anybody on the planet juicing stuff. That is for sure. And um, and so it's so nuanced. So it's like you got to you get say if I want to juice greens, I'm going to use a Santa 727 because it, it could you could run it at 40 RPMs and it's going to oxidize the least grind up the best. You know, I would say, actually, honestly, for most cases, vacuum blending and then putting it through a nut milk bag is the best overall because it's mm -hmm. going to get the driest pulp, the most yield. And the best tasting and highest nutrient quality. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's probably the best. I don't recommend using a blender and then blending it and then straining it because the difference is the vacuum during the grinding process. And you're actually oxidizing things more in a standard blender, you know, than even a fast juicer or a slow juicer mm -hmm. from some of the data I've seen. Wow. Yeah. So even when you have a blender like the Vitamix and you have the top on, like sealed on, that like that's still not good right because of all the air you still get a lot of air through there without the proper vacuum oh just look 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 in the blender when you're when you're mm -hmm. blending it and you can see that funnel cone going down if you just blend water you'll see the little vortex and that's like a tornado we don't get tornadoes here where i live but some places the tornadoes tear up houses and destroy walmarts and <laughs> kill people and that's what you are doing to your nutrients when you're using a standard blender now you know, hey, is blending better than nothing? Because you wouldn't eat the food otherwise. Absolutely. But, yeah. You know, times are changing and there's always new things coming out. And I mean, Nate and Lisa, you know, I they learned about vacuum blending when I made videos about it three years ago. And they're like, oh, we need to get one. But then they never did. And then I, they just got one. And now they're just like, oh, my God, we should have got this earlier. It makes such a difference because you don't realize the difference it makes until you try it. I wish I wish I could like set up a booth in every Costco around the country and feed people regular blended and vacuum blended side by side. People will taste the difference. I mean, nine out of 10, I believe, maybe there'll be that 10 person doesn't like it. They'll say, wow, this is way better. Yeah. yeah I've seen Ted Carr has been posting lately in his stories with the vacuum blender. And I've been thinking, you know what? I should get one of those. Now I want to get one. So I'll definitely link all your stuff below too, for anybody who's interested. Cause you, you sell all that too, right? You have, yeah, you can give me absolutely. some links for that. Just to the U S though, not to Canada. Oh, okay. Well, I'll figure it out. Um, I'm wondering too, over the years, have you done a lot of cleanses? Like, have, I don't know if I've seen videos of yours on like, have you do, do juice cleanses? Do you do mono fruit cleanses, water fast, dry fast? Like, what are your views on all that? And yeah. <laughs> so my goal is to not have to get so toxic. You have to repent and do a cleanse. <laughs> so, so that's why literally half my day is I drink juice. All I've had today is like this is my third juice, and then I had like you know about a pound of straw, a pound of cherries. Normally, I would just do three juices, and then I'd eat some fruit, and then I'd have a salad meal, or I might do my salad meal and then my fruit later. So half my day, I'm like literally like drinking water for the, when I wake up. Then for the first two hours, I don't eat. Then I might have a juice when I get thirsty. Then I'll have like two or three juices at that point. So it's like literally, I'm doing an extended fast every single day. Yeah. So I'm a big advocate of extending your fast and reducing your eating window because I think eating too often is not good. Um, I've never tried dry fasting. In the early days, I did do a water fast and I need to do one again one of these days. <laughs> Maybe when I find a partner, we'll do a water fast together. We can support each other. Yeah, that would be hard to me. I've never done a water fast. Have you ever done a fruit, like a mono fruit fast? I do those sometimes and I love them. I mean, like I've never done one straight yeah. up. So I've eaten very simply over the years. And so to me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would go on a juice fast before I went on a mono fruit fast. I mean, just for a few reasons, because I mean, you're still having your digestive system is still working even on a mono fruit fast. Mm -hmm. Number one. And with the juices, it's working a lot less because mm -hmm. you're removing some of the fiber. Mm -hmm. Number two, on a mono fruit fast. And when I make a juice fast, I would not just drink orange juice. I think that'd be the worst. Because when you're in a mono fruit fast, it's great because you've got one kind of food going in. Your, your body knows how to digest it. But I personally believe, and I don't have any data or science to this effect, 
But if you stayed on a mono fruit fast for a period of time, you are selecting for certain gut buddies that like oranges or like bananas. And then all the other ones that like, wait, we like pomegranates. We like polyphenols. You know, we want, we, we're the ones that like make the acromancia. You're not getting those unless you're doing like pomegranate fruit fast. And then you're going to reduce some certain, you know, microbes in your gut that might not be beneficial. But you know, I know I've just- wondered about that too. And then I've read other things that say it's actually good for like resetting your microbiome and good for your microbiome. But I don't know. I've thought the same thing. I don't know. I don't know. The diversity thing for your microbiome, it's I think key. is really key. Cause I mean, certain, certain bacteria like to eat certain things and, you know, I mean, there's studies showing on water fasting will definitely um, change your microbiome for sure. So, you know, I, 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 I might not be a fa- in favor of like long-term water fast and especially the way I think many water fasts are done if it's not properly supervised uh, from a medical doctor, like at True North Health in Northern California, I think it could be quite bad and deplete people and, uh, you know, bring them, bring them, sometimes bring them back to past the point of no return and even kill them. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it has happened in the raw food community before with some of the people that fast people. Mm-hmm. Crazy. Water. Yeah. That's so sad. Crazy. Wow. So Wow. So I'd say I would recommend a juice fast. I'll make a video soon on how I would do a juice fast. Yeah, that'd be a great video. A lot of people ask me, like, how do you do a proper juice fast? So that'd be a great video. You know, what a lot of people want to know, like the fruit to green ratio and how much do you drink a day and how do you get cheaper produce and to That's do a juice fast. Be in the video. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> You're a video machine. It's awesome. Yeah, because so I, 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 I juice for the cheapest and make the healthiest juices. So I know how to do it. <laughs> So I'm just wondering, why do you think, I know a lot of people ask me too, like, why do you think some vegans like look sick? Like some vegans don't look so great. And then other vegans look like really great. Vegans or raw vegans? Well, in general, I guess raw vegans, even like, you know, some raw vegans look like people say some raw vegans look sickly. Like why do some not look good? And then others, some fruitarians look amazing. And what's your opinion on that? So. Number one, I want to say that you can't judge a person on their looks Mm -hmm. because you can look amazing and have makeup on and just be totally ugly underneath. Yeah. (laughs) But um, that being said, I would say that a lot of people that get into raw foods, number one, are are coming from a state where they're looking for a healing from something. That's why I got into raw foods because I was sick, almost lost my life. And, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't look healthy when I got into raw foods. I mean, I was chubbed out and like, um, you know, just overweight and you bloated and like, wasn't good. So, so a lot of people get into raw foods are already, already maybe sick. So that's already, you know, a compounding issue. Mm-hmm. Number two, you know, when you get into raw foods, you might already look in pretty good shape or not. Plus also looks are highly subjective. You know, there's, different channels online that'll say vegans look bad. I think, you know, some of those people that they say look bad, look good. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So it's highly subjective. There's no like what's looking healthy and everybody has their own idea of what healthy is. And unfortunately the U S and probably Canada too, I'm not sure on the stats on Canada, but over 70% of the population in America is overweight. So then we tend to think that like, if you got some weight on you, you look healthy. And if you're skinny, you're sickly. And you know, I think that, I mean, it comes down to basically a more accurate way would be like, what is your BMI? Because that's a more accurate way of determining if your height to body weight ratio is is good or not. Mm -hmm. Um, And then some people just don't, just won't ever look as good. You know, I, I, you know, a lot of, I I, I do see that people can have a raw glow and they can look, you know, glowing or not. And the thing is like everybody, if you just do a raw foods diet, what does that mean? Does that mean you're eating like, you know, romaine and dates and bananas all day, and you don't eat any arugula, you don't grow your own food, you don't get jackfruit, you don't get organic cherries because they're too expensive. You know, what are you doing on your raw? Are you just making like sprouted lentils and eating sprouted lentils all day? That's raw. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I don't know what these people eat. Like, I know what I eat. I know how I look. And I eat a wide variety of stuff. I could probably do some more sprouted, you know, beans and some sprouts and stuff once in a while. But, you know, I eat a a really wide variety of foods. And the other thing is, like, when you get into raw foods, like, traditionally, 
some of the people that like don't look well on raw foods and then don't succeed and then go back to eating, you know, like animal foods, like you got to look like what are the trends, what diet, what specific raw food diet, what teachers did they specifically follow? Mm-hmm. In general, I'll say that the, the people that have lit, lit, you know, done that traditionally do a high fruit diet. In addition, in many cases, they fast and maybe fasting too long, messing up their gut microbiome. And then mm-hmm. they eat a very limited diet, limited scope. They're not going out and eating arugula and, you know, purple mizuna and, you know, mustard, spinach and all these crazy things. And they're just sticking like people are creatures of habit. They'll go to the store every week. I get bananas, romaine lettuce, and I get some avocados or and they get the same things. I mean, I have mm-hmm. friends that go shopping and they get the same things every week. For me, every time I go shopping, I'm like, I'm going to get whatever's freaking organic and the cheapest and looks good <laughs> and maybe i'll spend some money on some stuff that looks good that is more expensive than i'd like but i haven't eaten in a while because i want to eat it yeah you know, and that's how i shop and like because i do that in most times i'll always eat something different because everything's different things are on sale all the time you know so i really rotate it i do my best to rotate up like yesterday i actually went out of my way to buy jackfruit so I got fresh jackfruit, 20 bucks, you know? So good. Like, so worth it. It's so good. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like a ripe one too. So I was like, I got to mix up my diet, you know, cause right. Especially in the winter, you know, I just ran out of my organic cherries. I bought, you know, in the like end of last month. And uh, I'm like feeling the fruit pinch, even though I still got like at least a flat or two of persimmons to eat, you know, and apples and some citrus and stuff, but yeah, the winter could be difficult. And then, but then I also thought in my garden today, I'm like, okay, the winter is difficult for raw food. It's because there's not a lot of good fruit out, but maybe the winter time is the best time to eat greens. As I'm looking at my mm-hmm. garden, like what grows right now? What would be growing in cold weather? Like greens, maybe we should eat more greens in the winter time and like, yeah. you know, not eat as much fruit. I mean, I eat a vegetable based raw food diet, which is also a very uncommon thing as well, you know, cause most people eat a fruit based diet, you know, yeah. and eating a vegetable raw foods diet. I'm not going to say it's easy. It's not no. easy. Yeah, I know. When I think of greens and vegetables, like I think of you in this community, you know, you eat a lot of greens and it's great. I mean, the greens just have so much life force. They do so much for the body, right? Yeah. And the protein, I mean, you, you asked about protein early and the, I mean, the greens are my number one source of protein and more importantly, micronutrients. I mean, that's something that's not talked about so much in the raw food community, micronutrients, including, you know, different kinds of minerals and, you know, uh, plant compounds, polyphenols, like different you know, pigments. Mm -hmm. Um, but the minerals I think are key. And so many people are demineralized. I also eat seaweed. Mm -hmm. Many raw foodists may shun seaweed because it's a filter feeder or whatever. And there's different kinds of fiber and different kinds of seaweeds and Mm -hmm. also different, you know, trace minerals like iodine. Iodine's important. uh, I think a lot of vegans neglect iodine. It's so important. Yeah. I mean, then I eat crazy things like natto from Japan. That's like, you know, has the vitamin K2. Mm -hmm. So I'm really trying to get all my nutritional needs met first, you know, from food. And then secondarily, if I can't get something from food, then I'll supplement, you know, but I I do take supplements in capsules that are foods that are just powdered up, Mm -hmm. you know, to get that food into me, to get those nutrients into me before I have to take like an isolated, you know, supplement. And do you have your own products at all or no? I don't sell products, man. I teach people to grow food. It's better than yeah. products. Yeah, you don't have any of your own. Like, no, I agree. I, I sell agree. juicers and they're not my own. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I try to freely promote all the best ones out there. And I, I test them myself. I made a video earlier today testing a cheap $100 machine against a $700 machine. So people could find out what makes a $700 machine much better than the $100 machine. And, you know, it's about an 18% difference in yield, about 14 extra years of wow. warranty a better tasting juice, lots of different things, you know, it's so nuanced. So, but yeah, I don't, I don't want to have any products because like I would feel I'm selling out. So like, I just, I teach people to, I teach people to eat healthy and take control of their diet by growing their own food, which is ever more important than getting somebody hooked to buying a supplement or some kind of product. You got to keep buying every month. Right. I Mm -hmm. want people to grow food and grow food all no. year round. Right? I admire you like so much. So much more important in my opinion. It is. It's so important. It, it is. I, I love how you do that. I think it's amazing. And it's a great example for people. And you teach people so much. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'd love, okay. I, so I posted on the community section of my channel that I was going to have you on and I, my viewers have some questions for you. So I'd love to get sure. into these questions before we let you go. But so raw alchemy asks, so 
They said, I would love to know what John thinks about drinking raw homemade nut milks during longer juice feasts for getting some healthy fats in versus just sticking to fruits and green juices. <laughs> That's a good question. So I don't know that I would drink nut milks if I did a juice fast. Um, what I would do is I would incorporate some nuts into the juice. Okay. You know, or, or some fats into the juice at the time. That's a good you know, idea. So for example, like if you're making a green juice, you could soak some nuts, you know, the night before and then put that through the juicer when you're juicing your vegetables, that'll wring out some of the fats and put it into the juice. So now you're getting smaller amounts of fat along with your greens that could increase the uptake of certain nutrients. Because if you're just drink a if you're just drinking like a juice fast and you have a nut milk, it's like so much fat. Yeah. Plus, like honestly, if you drink a, a green juice fast and you just do a nut milk, you're like, fuck the green juice. I want more nut milk. Yeah, that happened to me before. When I did 37 <laughs> days, I had some and then I was like, so yeah, I was like that. That'd be a, a much wiser thing to do, would be just to incorporate a little bit of time. I mean, I probably the one of the best would be like probably one of the best things to do, actually, honestly, is you want to grind up flax seeds, you know. And then uh, just add that to the juice before you drink it. You know, just mm -hmm. a little bit of flax seeds every once in a while because flax fiber is quite beneficial, anti-cancer for women in studies. And, um, you know, we could always use more omega-3s because most people eat too many omega-6s. Yeah, I agree. And what do you think about flax oil? Sometimes I have a little bit of flax oil on my salads. What are your views on that or no? So actually the juicer that I use today can make flax oil and I have used the attachment to make flax oil. But honestly, I'm not a fan of, oils in general mm -hmm. um you know i would much rather use the whole food so like all most of my salads or soups actually have flax in it but it's not mm -hmm. oil i just put flax into my dressing and just blend that up in there mm -hmm. you know so yeah but that being said you know it's like if you're omega if you're getting too many sixes flax oil is a better way to you know get some threes in you but then on the other hand i would just rather like instead of just taking flax oil for the omega threes, then our bodies have to convert into you know EPA and DHA if our bodies are properly converting or not. I just take a algae oil, you know, mm -hmm. in a supplement. So that's like very small quantities. I'm not like, <laughs> you know, just a, a little capsule to make sure I got my DHA and EPA because I believe it to be important. Me too. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay, so Raw Saga City says, "What is your skincare routine, John?" So I have a video on it where I get into my skincare routine. I really don't do a lot. It's really simple, right? And actually, it's all outlaid in that video. The, out, the video, like my, most of my videos, are like an hour or something like that, where I really get into my skincare. And, and you know, I don't really put anything on my skin. I put like uh, jojoba oil on my skin. And that's the only thing I put on my skin. And I have like these little buff pads that people use for makeup to like buff my skin off to like exfoliate, basically. Yeah. And then I put the hobo oil on and that's pretty much it. That's all I do. It's um, mostly the foods I feel like, and they shine through and do give that glow, you know? Yeah. So that's what, in my video, I talk about like the foods I eat, you know, are very specific and I'm eating mm -hmm. a lot of different things for certain reasons. You know, I always want to get high vitamin C content in my diet because vitamin C plays a role in creating, you know, collagen also proper amounts of fats you know i eat a handful of two of nuts and seeds a day mm -hmm. lately i've been like cracking some few nuts after dinner too because that's kind of fun and, and when you when you have to eat them in a the shell which i have a video on why you should get in shell nuts versus shelled nuts it'll slow you down from eating them too plus they're fresher and they taste better mm -hmm. plus right now after christmas since they had them they sell them for christmas every year after christmas i get like the deals because they stores will put them on clearance because like nobody buys nuts i guess outside the holidays <laughs> wow i got them for like 99 cents a pound for nuts in the shell wow that's amazing i got 16 <laughs> pounds worth yeah stocked up for the year wow <laughs> 16 dollars <laughs> wow okay so mother earth voice asks can you please talk about his dating life would he date a non-vegan or a non-raw vegan is it different to find a partner who understands and accepts your lifestyle john also, John, why won't you share your age with us? <laughs> I, I was going to ask your age, but then a couple people said they want to know your age, but you don't tell people. So I, it's your, obviously your choice if you don't want to tell us. Yeah, why don't I share my age? Well, I would just recommend looking up um, Goddesses Never Age, uh, Dr. Northrup. And, and then she has a really good video on that. So yep. that's basically my reasoning. Okay. Uh, you know, 
Of course. Um, and, then, yeah. and I respect that. But yeah, I respect that totally. Eight, 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 I mean, I could say age is just a number. And I could also say that, you know, too much emphasis in our society is on age and on mm -hmm. time in general. And, you know, I don't wear a watch. And, it, and, you know, and if I did wear a watch, it's like a guy I met at Woodstock. Well, what the face would say, it would say now. <laughs> yeah. You know, he had that watch. And I was like, that's a cool watch because the time is now. And we get so involved with this whole time constraint. Does my dog know it was his birthday two weeks ago? Mm -hmm. Does he care <laughs> that it's a New Year's? Is he going to New Year's resolution? No, he doesn't care about any of that stuff. And it's like, we got to work at eight, get off at five and eat dinner at nine. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm on my body's clock. I eat when I'm hungry. I go to bed when I'm tired at night. I wake up whenever I get, wake up in the morning. And I think people are too consumed with this whole construct called time that humans have created. That's just I agree. Opinion. So true. Great points. So, and then, so yeah, that's, that's part of the age thing also is like this whole time construct that I kind of rebel against. <laughs> well, I respect that. I admire that. Unless I got an airline flight, then I got to, I got to deal with some time. <laughs> <constructs>. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the dating, that's interesting. So like, so I haven't, well, yeah, I did date a non-vegan like, like, you know, six months ago. Wow. So, yeah. So the thing is I would date a non-vegan, but, and that's a big, but, <laughs> but they have to have one of their primary values in life as their health. Yeah. Good point. Because, because if they don't have their health as a priority, they just are not going to understand all my crazy shit. I do. No. <laughs> yeah. So true. Straight up. So, and it's like, but if they want to eat some animal products, like I'm not going to like freak out, like, but here's the thing if they have health as their main priority and they're halfway intelligent, which I, I eternally <laughs> date people that are at least halfway intelligent, <laughs> um, then they're pretty much only going to eat very little animal products mm -hmm. because I wouldn't eat somebody on a keto diet unless it's like a vegan keto diet with, yeah. I don't know, like anyways, because it, it, the science shows that you, I mean, you got to eat the overwhelming majority of plants and whole food plants to be healthy and if your health is your primary objective and you're not doing that, I don't think that aligns. I mean, yeah, it wouldn't align like meat diet would might disagree with me or something, but I do see there's, there are benefits to eating a keto diet, what, you know, for certain periods of time. And actually one of the things I want to do is I want to do diet cycling, but I'm not at that advanced stage yet where I go plant-based keto or just fast to get into ketosis and then not do it and just rotate in and out of that. Because I mean, that's what we're supposed to do in nature over a thousand years when we, we didn't have grocery stores and we couldn't always find food and mm -hmm. we maybe not even didn't even grow food, you know, like back in the day when we had to forage stuff. Cause like, just like dogs, dogs hunt every day, they're not going to eat, find something or kill something to eat or scavenge something. Some days they are going to not eat. And some days I get lazy and not feed my dog. He don't like me too much on those days, but I'm extending <laughs> his life and he will be healthier for it. <laughs> so, so, um, but yeah, so I would date something that's not vegan as long as health is our main priority. And in general, they would probably consume mostly plant foods with maybe some high quality animal products. Mm -hmm. And if, then if we ever did get more serious and move in together, then I would like really hold them accountable to the animal products they ate. Like, hey, if you want to eat eggs, you know, I'm cool with that. But we, we got you, we got to have chickens that you get to feed my vegetable scraps and you have to take care of them so that mm -hmm. you can eat your eggs. And, mm -hmm. and then- also, then it would be like, you know, I don't like, I don't want to see, I don't want to like control them, but at the same time, <laughs> I would want them to like, want them to eat like no more than like, I don't know, one or two <laughs> eggs a week or something yeah. like, you know, not a lot eggs, a concentrated source of nutrients. You know, I would rather eat what the chickens eating to make the nutrients that are going to be in the eggs, <laughs> you know, and eat more plants. And that's why I juice a lot because it concentrates a lot of food and all animals, they just concentrate plants. <laughs> and then we eat them to get concentrated plant sources in them. In most cases, people say, oh, meat's good because the amino acids. Dude, well, eat more plants, get more amino acids, want more protein, eat more plants, don't need to eat meat. You know, animals also can bioaccumulate minerals. So heavy metals, bad minerals, good minerals, you know, eat some seaweed, get some minerals, eat more nutrient-dense homegrown plants to get more minerals. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I would say that um, and then also too, if they want to eat and like straight up meat, I would say we have to raise the animals and you'd have to kill them. I mean, I would really not <laughs> They're like gonna that. They're going to say, John, this is I'll, all too yeah, many rules for me. I'm out of here. 
Yeah. But no, because I mean, if they, if truly, if that's, if health is their goal, they're going to want to have the highest, cleanest source of meat. And we could do it our better ourselves. I mean, I would hope that we could just rescue animals and when they keeled over one day, they could eat them. But, you know, but hopefully I end up going out with a vegan, but, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to, or, or a raw vegan, because I mean, I, I can't even go out with a vegan. That's a problem because most <laughs> vegans, I mean, it's great that they're into animals and they're in animal welfare and they're protecting the animals, but nowhere in the definition of vegan is anything about health, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's like, they're just a junk food vegan. Like, could I go on the junk food vegan? I have less with, I have less in common with a junk food vegan than I do with somebody that's eating a healthy 90% plant-based diet with maybe 10% animal products. That's whole yeah. food and a wide variety of foods. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the dating, uh, the dating life is a little bit uh, difficult because I've uh, automatically reduced my, um, <laughs> you know, dating pool significantly. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You're a character and I love it. So when you were dating this non-vegan six months ago, did you find like, did this person ever feel guilty around you? I know a lot of raw vegans, like even sometimes with me, sometimes I feel like when I'm eating with other people, cause I just like my health is to the extreme other people start to question their choices around me and then kind of feel bad. And I never, ever want anybody to feel bad. I respect however anyone eats, even if they're eating donuts, I respect what they want to do. But did she ever feel like, did she ever feel bad around you? Cause you're like so healthy and you know, do you know what I mean? I never really talked about that with her. And when we went out to eat, we only went to places that I would actually eat at too, where I could order something, you know, that'd be raw. That would meet my criteria. And she never ordered meat around me. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Mm hmm. When I, I, you know what? I never crave meat now or never miss me. I know some raw vegans do, but I just, you know, I don't miss it. Um, okay. So Poppy says, tell him to look into Eli Martyr's work. One love. I don't know. I have had Eli on the channel. I'm actually pretty close friends with Eli. Do you, have you, but Eli's fruitarian. So it's so he's different than what you dude, do. Right. Yeah. He's fruitarian. So that's way different than. Yeah. See, so like, why would I, I mean, not yeah. to say that what he's doing is wrong. Cause for him, it's totally working. And I mean, I agree yeah. with that. And you know, to me, you know, fruit's good. I love fruit, but let's not neglect our vegetables and let's not neglect, you know, I mean, when you're eating fruit, you're limiting the, I mean, there's like, I don't even know how many kinds of different plant foods on the planet. And when you start eating raw, you're eating this many. And now when you're eating only fruit, you're eating this many. Mm -hmm. And I think that's not going to be feral for the long term. Did personally. you ever try fruitarian or no? I mean, I ate like I ate mostly fruit in my younger years because it's, it's hella good. And I get, you don't want to eat vegetables. I get it. I've done it. I've seen the consequences, you know, and I've, I've seen a lot of people not do well on fruit and, yeah. you know, you also got to listen to your body. So my body told me like, dude, you don't want to do this. I mean, it was good for a while. Cause you could, you, our bodies will adapt and be good for a while. But one day, you know, I don't think he's going to be fruitarian for the rest of his life. Maybe, maybe he'll, you know, adjust and make some course adjustments one of these days. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once again, like we're making a video today and like this video could be no different than somebody else's video that gets, you know, 50,000 views. But like, mm -hmm. I think my, my opinions should have a little bit more weight behind them because I've been, I've been doing this for 27 years now, mm -hmm. you know, and I've seen what works, what doesn't, I've tried a lot of things and experimented on myself, you know, and that's all I'm going to say. And it might not be, you know, whatever. Yeah. This is a long time you've done it. Um, okay. Sydney long says, can you ask what, what John's top three favorite raw vegan dishes are? <laughs> like if I make food or what, like, or just any in the whole world, what are your three top favorite raw vegan? I like my dishes? pizza a lot. That's like my favorite. I have video. I have uh, pictures on my Instagram on my raw vegan pizza. I make, yeah, it has a few heat. Well, you could, you could make it all raw vegan. My crust is all raw. I add some toppings sometimes that are heat processed, mm -hmm. like mushrooms, I think. And then like uh, artichoke hearts, maybe even the olives and capers. I try mm -hmm. to get the ones that are raw, but they might not be raw. Mm -hmm. But um, I like the pizza a lot. I mean, the other thing is I'm pretty, I'm not like, I don't get super fancy. Like my pizza is probably the fanciest thing I do. Cause like, to me, I'm not, I'm not trying to eat for fanciness. I'm just trying to eat for health. You know, that's what it comes down to. And I'm kind of just more, I don't know, more plain. I mean, my, my favorite raw meals are soups. If I make a good raw soup based on bell peppers and I have a video on how I do that, you know, it, it's like, I love that. I love my raw pepper soup recipe. Mm -hmm. and I mean, sometimes I'll switch it up. If I can't get peppers, you know, I'll do carrot juice or I'll do tomato juice. 
as the base. I blended some nuts and seeds, herbs and spices, and then basically I just pile in all different kinds of, you know, mostly raw plant foods, seaweeds, natto, tempeh, um, you know, fresh greens from my garden, olives, capers, all kinds mm -hmm. of different, you know, highly nutritious foods in there. Mm -hmm. And then probably after that, what I really like. I'd say I like my ice creams a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. Raw I ice creams my, are good. I make my own ice creams and I don't use cashews. Mm -hmm. I just basically make coconut milk out of, out of uh, white coconuts. And then basically I blend in dates. And if I just put a vanilla bean, that's like the simple recipe. But lately when I get cannabis, because it's, uh, it's kind of rare for me to get cannabis, I'll usually turn it into a juice and then I'll basically put the cannabis or the hemp into the ice cream. So then I'll have a cannabis ice cream flavored with vanilla and dates and coconut. Wow. And it's a nice treat. And like the texture is just like real ice cream. And when I make, if I make a vanilla version, like it'd be difficult to determine if it's like not that it's like, you know, all raw and vegan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, okay. So garden bliss says, did you ever get sick eating raw tempeh? So this viewer said, you say you eat raw tempeh, but you cook mushrooms, John, <laughs> and you called the so I think they're saying like, isn't it dangerous to eat because you're not cooking it, but then you cook the mushrooms. And then how can you view mold as a probiotic? All right. So uh, number one, raw tempeh. So I have eaten raw. Okay. So, okay. First, there's some studies that say that raw tempeh is um, like you could get sick from. And that's why mm -hmm. they always recommend cooking your tempeh. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. What they don't tell you is that all the tempeh you buy at a health food store that's in a little shrink rack package has already been pasteurized. So it has been heat processed. And then people usually still cook it because it says heat cook it on there. All right. So that's that's number one. Number two, you can find raw tempeh if you find a tempeh maker that'll sell it to you raw, which there are very few because they also believe that it could be problematic. Although I haven't ever heard of an outbreak or somebody getting sick from it. Mm -hmm. I'm sure in third world countries where they make tempeh and there's some contamination of the, of the, you know, the, the bacteria or the mold or the, the fungi that grows the tempeh um, and it's not totally clean, uh, then you, there could be outbreaks. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the places, I mean, I visited a tempeh, far, a tempeh um, maker in Maui and I made a video at his place and they use like, you know, an inoculant, the inoculant they use is like a, a bot inoculant that's like totally clean and certified. So, you know, his raw tempeh, I would eat because here's the thing, like there's two components of the tempeh, the, the substrate, which is basically the beans and they've already cooked the beans to reduce the toxins in the beans. Then they fermented it with the, te with the, temp with the, with the substrate or the bacteria, the, the fungi or whatever you want to call it. And then you could eat it, right? So that's how I've eaten it. And that being said, even even though that's the raw one, I could really get that. There's I don't even know the guy in Maui is uh, around anymore selling it, but there's a guy in San Diego doing that, and maybe mm -hmm. a few other places. So it's extremely rare to get raw tempeh. If I if I did make it myself, which would be a whole process, it's probably not too hard. I did order a tempeh maker on like a Kickstarter, and they never sent it to me. They're like, oh, we're gonna come out with it. And they keep telling me they're gonna come out with it, and. I think I just lost my money on that one because that would make it easy. But if I did make raw tempeh, I would absolutely eat it because I would know I would use like, you know, the, the certified clean starter mix or whatever. Um, so, and then, on, but on mushrooms, it's a different story. See, there's many different kinds of mushrooms and some mushrooms are straight up toxic if they're not heat processed. Mm -hmm. In addition, um, on mushrooms, because the mushroom actually grows the fiber. And yeah, to a lesser extent, there's some fiber probably in the tempeh that the mushroom, that the, the culture makes that's this white stuff in there. Um, you know, heat processing the chitin, which is the fiber the mushrooms make, can make it more digestible mm -hmm. and remove the toxins from the mushrooms. I only heat process my mushrooms for like, I mean, I did the batch yesterday for three minutes because I had like king oyster, which have fat ass stems, which I've never eaten before. And it probably needed a little more time. And I still didn't like, I still didn't like them um, because this, it was just too much stem and not enough cap. <laughs> but me, my, my, my microbiome might've liked it more. And then my dog, he ate them all up. So he liked it and it digested well for him. It came out today because I fed it to him last night. 
because <laughs> I saw it, and his poop smelled like mushrooms. I'm like, <laughs> this is some good smelling dog poop. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't digest the peanuts. <laughs> they came so I whole. guess I guess people have to be careful then just going to the grocery store, like if they're new to raw and they just buy any type of mushroom and throw it in their salad. I guess they have to be careful doing that then, right? They, well, most mushrooms, well, depending on the mushroom at the store. I mean, I'm no mushroom expert, but I did talk to the mushroom expert, Paul Stamets, who wrote a book on mushroom at the trade show. And he, basically he said for the most part, and it also depends on the quantity, you know, some mushrooms are highly toxic. I mean, most standard buttons, technically you really shouldn't eat those raw, but if you just eat a few of them, it shouldn't be problematic for you, but everybody's a little bit different, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you eat a lot more, I'm trying to like amp up my mushrooms. Plus the other thing that's more important for me is I want to break down that fiber and it is shown in studies. I don't, I haven't have a mushroom study yet, but it is shown in studies that purple sweet potatoes that have been heat processed, cooled, and then eaten are better for your microbiome than them raw. So mushrooms, especially when the chitin is so hardcore to digest, heat processing it breaks open the cell walls, may make it a little bit easier for us to digest. I have to, I'll have to look into that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to me, I also do what like intuition, what is, what is my body tell me I should do? Mm -hmm. Like my body feels better with heat processing in my mushrooms than eating them raw. You know, I would eat shiitake mushrooms raw because before I ate, before I started heat processing mushrooms, I would eat mushrooms raw sometimes. And I sometimes break out in this funky rash. And wow. that hasn't happened since I've, because once again, there's some toxins in there. Yeah. You know, so um, since I've been heat processing, I haven't noticed any adverse effects. And um, yeah, so, you know, different mushrooms, even though they're both fungus, you mm -hmm. know, you got to deal with them differently mm -hmm. is, is what I'd say. And see, talking about intuition, that's the last question. So Raw Cuba, Cuba says, I know John is all about research and science, but what can he speak on about intuition? Meaning if raw foods feel right, um, is there really a need to introduce heat processed foods? And yeah. So did my intuition tell me to heat process some foods or was that the science or was that a combination of both? <laughs> That's a good question. So, you know, I could say that intuition could get us so far, you know, because mm -hmm. I guess somebody could also counter me and say, but what if your intuition is all right? And should you believe in the science, which could also be hogwash mm -hmm. <laughs> and some many, a lot of science is hogwash in my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that's a difficult subject. So what I try to do is I try to look at the science and then see how that fits with me. And, and then also then test it on myself and see how I feel. Mm -hmm. I guess the, the, be, the best thing to do would be before I started eating heat processed food, just do a more scientific approach subject or scientific mm -hmm. approach. So if you think you want to eat heat processed foods, but are unsure because your intuition tells you not, let's see how your body reacts. So do a full blood panel and do a full microbiome panel, right? Before you start, he, including the heat processed foods, I can't do that because I'm already... I've already gone the way of the heat processed foods um, and then do that for, you know, several months and, and adjust it and then do another microbiome and another blood test panel. I yeah. mean, once again, those are snapshots in time to show you what's up. And I would, I would definitely venture to say, if you do heat processed foods, like I am, I would venture to say that I would bet money and I'm not a betting man that your microbiome would probably be more diverse afterwards because you're eating a wider diversity of foods that you were not eating at when you're, as you're raw. And then that's basically just what the science said. Mm -hmm. So if the science is correct, that should be correct. And especially for me, because I come from an autoimmune, you know, challenge that I want to overcome, you know, the, the gut microbiome is, is like linked with the immune system. So like, I don't want to play around to just say I could be a raw foodist but maybe my microbiome is not as good because I'm a raw foodist because I got to mm -hmm. stick to the stupid label. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still believe hundred percent, you know, I'm into raw foods and like, I want to minimally process my food, but, but, but I've evolved to think instead of just raw foods, what is raw foods really the core? What does that really mean to me? And it means raw foodists are really concerned about how the food is processed. And in most cases, raw food is sim you know, a simpleton would think, Raw food is not processed under 118 degrees because mm -hmm. that's like the main raw foodist criteria. Mm -hmm. And that's great. 
not processing food under 118 is great, but you could process agave nectar under 118 and it's still not healthy for you. Mm-hmm. So it's like more than just the heat process. And I've, I've had videos on this where I talk about just because it's raw doesn't mean it's healthy. Had those videos like 10 years ago, mm-hmm. you know, and it's more about the process. So what is the process? How is it processed? Everything you eat. I mean, and the process to me also is including the growing process, mm-hmm. which I now control. So my goal is to control every part of the process of the foods I eat and process the least amount to maintain the majority of the health, the, the most of the health benefits, whatever, mm-hmm. whatever they're coming from, the fiber, the phytonutrients, the polyphenols, which I also believe to be very important. Not a lot of people in raw foods talk about like polyphenols and, you know, these plant compounds mm-hmm. that are critical that when a plant is stressed out, they actually create more of mm-hmm. these plant toxins to ward off the the bad guys so that the plants don't get eaten. But then also when we eat them, you know, they could also give us more benefits as well. Mm -hmm. So interesting. And you know what? There was one last question. I just remembered somebody did ask what your diet was before. Like, what did you eat exactly before, like before your health problems or like growing up, what was your diet? Like, Mm, gotta go back in the memory (laughs) for a while. (laughs) So like when I was growing up as a child, basically, I mean, my parents would shop at the co-op way back in the day. And so we didn't, we weren't allowed to get like sugary cereal, like tricks and cocoa pebbles and fruity pebbles and all that crap. We got like skim milk. <laughs> my parents fed us skim milk. My parents wouldn't let us have hot dogs because it had like sodium nitrate that is, you know, back then the research said caused cancer. Mm-hmm. So we would just get like other meats, although we ate meat. Um, my parents wouldn't really buy that many vegetables when I was growing up. Unfortunately, we had some, and a lot of them were canned. You know, we would get spinach like in this frozen block. <laughs> Not, we would barely ever get fresh spinach. I can't really remember. I mean, we would eat some vegetables, but man, we we're just a, more of a standard American household with a health emphasis. Although mm-hmm. my parents would, um, we would cook a lot and actually had to learn to cook at a young age because both my parents worked and I actually had to cook. I'd have to cook the meals for the family and make like meatballs and this all this tuna crap and all this other stuff with pasta Mm -hmm. i wouldn't say it was the healthiest and then after i moved out to go to college then i was a bit more aware i stopped eating red meat at that point and at 21 i also stopped drinking alcohol because i just saw the problems it caused when i was in a fraternity that's good so you didn't drink at all in your 20s and your 30s right that's really good and then um well i don't know how old you are you could be in your 30s still (laughs) right and then um (laughs) And then I read my ingredient labels back yeah. then and I didn't eat red meat and I probably ate a little bit more vegetables, but still like, you know, I thought I ate healthy because I read my ingredient labels, didn't get all these long words with preservatives and crap. Mm-hmm. And I was eating like chicken and fish, you know, um, usually most days and maybe like oatmeal. But yeah, like, like my diet was not the best when mm-hmm. I was younger. Like I mm-hmm. wish, you know, I mean, I, I can't wait to have kids one day. I mean, you have the the joy of having kids to make yeah. sure that they're they're eating healthfully now so that they could not have any issues later. So I think I'm just making up for that now. And I hope one day to have some kids so I can, you know, teach them how to eat healthy and how to live more naturally because we sure as heck need some kids that are being taught the right stuff because so many kids are being taught the wrong stuff. Yeah, I agree. You would be a great teacher for kids. Oh yeah. That's one more thing. Somebody asked, I think, who are your, I don't know if I asked you this already, your top three teachers, you have like three mentors you've had through the years or like anybody you look up to in the field or even not in the field, just spiritually or health wise, or. I mean, I like, I, I, I like, uh, look up to Dr. Joel Furman. Mm-hmm. I'll definitely say that. Cause I mean, he really got me thinking about the eating more for nutrients and not just the calories and nutritarian. I mean, he was part of the reason why I started including some heat processed foods, do the research he's done. Um, and then I would say just in a general method, I would say uh, Tony Robbins, mm-hmm. you know, for his, uh, not necessarily in his food ideas these days, but basically more about his uh, motivational and, you know, uh, like, uh, like personal, you know, like, like building, like self-help building mm-hmm. got in his stuff like a long time ago. And then third one, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't really have a third one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> well, I look good. up like I don't want to have like any major gurus, but mm-hmm. I look up a lot of information, different, you know, scientific journal published studies, and like this morning I was watching videos all on, you know, like from like 
universities on microbiome and soluble and insoluble fiber and the effects and all these things. And actually, I learned this morning that like, even if you're eating like a, like an inulin or like the fibers that our bacteria like to eat, they could actually switch and maybe even eat like cellulose and then create amino acids for us. Wow. You know, so that's actually kind of a, a different kind of take some of the latest research on that. So maybe we don't need to necessarily get our amino acids from the foods because our mm -hmm. microbiome could potentially, if stressed, could do some of that for us, mm -hmm. you know, um, interesting. So that was quite interesting. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't, I don't really have like any major teachers because, you know, once mm -hmm. again, I also believe that every, every teacher that's teaching something may have bias and may not be correct, mm -hmm. you know? So I really like to like, look at people that have been doing this a while and, you know, have some, also some research or data behind them, mm -hmm. you know, and that had like, I, I tend to like teachers that have like looked at the broader picture, mm -hmm. you know, and then, um, and then kind of like, we'll share their thoughts on it to like, it, but get a lot of other people's thoughts and they're just coming up on their own. And that's like a lot of what I believe is, is not through just what I think, but is from many other teachers and people that know a lot more than me, plus my own experiences. Mm hmm. Exactly. And this is great. You've been doing it so long. It's amazing. Right. And it, like, imagine wonder where your life would be had you not like discovered this health path. You know what I mean? Well, I, I kind of know because my brother's two years younger than me. He looks older than me. He's clinically obese by his doctor. Mm -hmm. He will not appear in a video with me because actually I'd love to make a video with him because showing basically the same genes. I mean, we have some minute differences. He's not my twin or anything. But we basically have the same genes and he leads a, basically a, the standard American lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's what I would be overweight. I would have knee pains, leg pains, arm pains. I wouldn't be able to climb with my kid up to the tallest structures and, you know, wiggle through these little small open ways and things and stuff. And mm -hmm. like, yeah, I, I would, yeah, I would probably smoke a lot more weed. <laughs> I mean, I don't smoke <laughs> yeah. any weed. <laughs> I, I do edibles, but I don't yeah. like do it to get high, but like, I might need to do that to cope with the pain. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't really, I, I don't want to know what I would be like. Cause I don't, yeah. that's not how I want to live. No. And I'm glad that I have at least a reference point. And this that, is definitely um, your destiny. I feel like. Yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm glad I'm able to do what I'm doing and I'm glad to be in the health I am because um, otherwise I wouldn't be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, this has been awesome. Thanks so much for being on today. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, it's been amazing. And to the viewers, I hope you guys did enjoy this. If you did, give it a big thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.